Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Ristabin from Olympus NDT. I'd like to welcome everyone today to this webinar on bond testing C-Scan for the inspection of composite honeycomb structures using the OmniScan MX. This webinar includes an introduction and an overview of the innovative new bond testing C-Scan solution for the inspection of composite honeycomb structures using the OmniScan MX flaw detector. You will learn about the powerful benefits of this solution and its advantages compared to existing techniques of testing composite materials. Our presenter today is Tommy Borgela. Tommy's worked for Olympus NDT for 13 years and is the product manager for the entire eddy current testing and bond testing line of products. This webinar should last approximately 45 minutes or so. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A panel in the lower right portion of your screen during the course of the presentation. If we don't get to your questions during the live webinar, they will be addressed personally either by email or by phone after the event is over. The presentation, along with the Q&A, will be archived on our website at www.olympus-ims.com. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tommy Borgela. Tommy, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Hello, everybody, and thank you for attending this webinar. So as Greg said, we're about to spend about 45 minutes together, and this webinar is about a new bound testing C-scan solution uh, that was released by Olympus about uh, uh, October 1st of this year. It is dedicated to composite honeycombs uh, being aircraft structures, boat hulls, or performance vehicles. It is very good at detecting and also sizing the disbounds, the delamination, or repairs. Today, we are going to go over the existing pitch catch method because uh, you probably guessed it, this solution is using pitch catch bound testing. We are going to talk a bit about physics. We are going to see the new solution, uh, its features, and being explained through some uh, sample studies to explain the capabilities. We are going to have an overview of the inspection process, and we are going to demonstrate it, too, with a live uh, display of the OmniScan screen. And we're going to conclude that by uh, speaking about the benefits of that solution. So composites are obviously an assembly of multiple layers and materials to increase the structural strength, which makes them a very good, uh, a very lightweight uh, component, ideal for aerospace structures. It is rather difficult to test when we speak about the honeycomb structures because ultrasound, for instance, cannot uh, fully inspect those structures. Uh, it can only inspect the top layer if, it, if it's thick enough. The, uh, to overcome that, there exist uh, since many years some methods like the tap test and bound testing with a few subdivisions to bound testing. The defects found in composite structures uh, as far as in-service defects being resulting from impact or overload damage um, may result in a disbound, uh, delamination, and obviously the inspector has to deal with the presence of repaired areas or putty, potted areas uh, where uh, there's another signal to analyze. Olympus manufactures, uh, as formerly as Stavely Instruments, the Boundmaster uh, portable unit, the Boundmaster 1000, that became the 1000 plus, then the E plus since many years. Uh, it is a portable equipment that is uh, excellent to test composite materials. It offers three modes, pitch and catch, resonance, and MIA, or mechanical impedance analysis. Uh, we are going to talk about pitch catch in this presentation. We will not uh, discuss resonance or MIA. That's outside the scope of this webinar. The pitch catch can be uh, in three sub-modes, if I may. Uh, being the RF, the impulse, or the swept displays of the pitch catch method. A pitch catch probe obvious, obviously has a pitch and the catch elements, two spring-loaded piezoelectric elements. Uh, they are broadband probes, and uh, 
basically they're connected to a low or high voltage output of the bound master. The method, uh, here's an illustration try to, uh, trying to explain how the signal uh, propagates in the pitch catch method. So on the left, on a good bound, there is energy flowing from the pitch to the catch and there's also energy sound waves being propagated through the uh, the whole assembly so the basically the sound energy is spread between the part and the, a direct connection to the uh, receiver through the surface when there is a disbound the uh, the ability to penetrate the part uh, with the sound is mainly lost because of the presence of a flaw so there's a whole lot more energy that goes from the, the transmitter to the receiver, and that creates a, an increase in amplitude uh, on the instrument display. The pitch catch method will read changes in plate waves and compression waves. It is actually comparing a good bond condition to a defective, so it requires a standard, a calibration reference standard, or test piece. And the, uh, the pitch catch will display the changes in amplitude or phase using what is called a flying dot display, or uh, as an analogy to editorant, it is an impedance display. The pitch catch modes, or rather the displays of the Bound Master 1000 E Plus, uh, I said earlier there are three impulse, RF, and SWEP. So when dealing with um, fixed thickness or uh, fixed, as, uh, fixed profile assembly of composite uh, honeycombs, it is recommended or advised to go with those two methods, the RF or impulse. They, are, they have very similar capabilities. Uh, there's a, there are some historical or legacy reasons why to employ one or the other, but they're mainly the same thing, to the exception that their display is slightly different and that's what we call the RF display, the time series, or for ultrasonic uh, knowledgeable persons, it is also called an ASTM. So with the Boundmaster, we call that the RF display, radio frequency display. So the impulse has an envelope signal uh, representation, and the RF uh, is closer to the raw, uh, the raw signal from the, uh, from the amplifiers. When dealing with curved surfaces, it is uh, another story because there's a lot of changing uh, uh, signals uh, on curved surfaces, such as aircraft uh, wing flaps. Um, it is recommended to employ the swept frequency method. So uh, obviously the swept is a sweep of many frequencies across the range of the pitch catch probe, and it is mainly producing amplitude changes. So it is fairly easy to interpret because it's either a good, very tiny signal in the impedance plane, or if it's bad, it goes outside the alarm box and the instrument will uh, emit a sound. So that's fairly easy to interpret. We are not going to talk about swept anymore. We are going to concentrate on pitch catch, RF, or impulse for the remainder of this presentation because the bound testing solution that is, uh, the current topic uses this uh, a method very close to this. So, pitch catch, RF, or impulse uses a single or fixed frequency. It is displaying uh, signals apart from the RF also on the uh, flying dot display uh, associated to the position of the gate. And we are mainly looking for amplitude changes, although it is also possible to visualize phase changes uh, uh, even though there's not a whole lot of procedures out there that uh, call for that, it's also possible to do. There are a few challenges with uh, inspecting with a single frequency with a hand scanning method. Uh, the results are frequency dependent, which we are going to demonstrate in a minute. They are also operator dependent uh, because there's no real way of answering the operator is going to scan thoroughly the part uh, apart from trusting that operator, which is a great part of the inspection. The detection at a given frequency uh, is not necessarily proportional to a defect size. So uh, f let's say a one-inch defect might not produce a one-inch uh, signal 
or a perturbation on the surface when scanning over it. So you may be led to think it's a much smaller flaw, which is not the case all the time. Uh, the flying dot display is not that well adapted for flaw identification. The flying dot is actually not bad uh, when you get to understand how it works and the physics behind it, but it's not something uh, we can expect from a typical bound testing operator that is basically calling defects as a go-no-go. -no -go. Uh, the, the physics is a bit uh, advanced part of the phenomenon to be able to perform a thorough analysis. Speaking of the physics, there are two phenomena worth explaining in this uh, webinar. The membrane resonance, it is dominant for skin to core disbounds. Uh, so a given flaw will experience different resonant modes for different frequencies. That's what we see on the right side, uh, actually different frequencies here. So the resonant frequency will depend on the flaw size, the flaw shape, the part geometry, and actually other factors. We could name the, flaw, uh, the, the part thickness, thicknesses, the, uh, the first layer, the honeycomb, the type of core employed, and the list goes on. Velocimetric, it is a dominant phenomenon for the skin delamination detection, another phenomenon uh, that is, can be used to analyze signals properly. So a velocity variation of induced flexural waves indicative of change of structure, uh, that velocity variation will produce a phase shift in the impedance signal or flying dot display. Basically, there's going to be a delay occurring at the uh, delimination uh, position, so that signal, when it gets to the, the sound media again, will uh, retrieve its original frequency or velocity and will basically be shifted in phase. That becomes very handy, very useful for discriminating between the indication type uh, for the, the delimination. So it becomes possible to distinguish a DLAM from a disbound. This section is about the new solution, and here we can see uh, uh, in a cold uh, morning somebody <laughs> scanning with an OmniScan and a bound testing hand scanner. So attached to the OmniScan is a special purpose adapter that we are going to discuss in a minute. So the main features of that solution is it has, it is driving the probe, a pitch catch probe with eight frequencies. It is displaying color imagery as the C-scan, uh, displaying that C-scan as amplitude or phase displays. It allows a certain degree of sizing, and it is definitely a user-friendly method. I thought it would be worth uh, mentioning uh, or precising what kind of hardware this is as we presented this solution earlier, uh, we had a lot of questions on, is this a, really a new module? And actually, it is not a new module. It is reusing uh, the existing editrend array or editrend modules, which uh, will work, both of them will work with the bound testing solution, since they're using the ECT connector from, uh, from the basics. It is uh, an um, OmniScan MX it's one based solution. It is using a mixture of existing and new hardware, so existing probes, existing and new scanners, and we are going to detail that in a couple minutes. Uh, so why is that possible? So we're doing bound testing on an eddy current instrument. How is that possible? Well, bound testing, at least the pitch catch uh, RF style, it's possible to do on an eddy current instrument because bound testing and eddy current share several electrical and conceptual similarities. They have a very common frequency range, at least a bound testing pitch catch is very close to low frequency eddy current uh, for subsurface uh, detection, for instance. Uh, the, cir the circuitry is very similar. The main difference lies in the voltage being used, so the bound testing probes will employ from their nature a higher voltage, plus they have a higher voltage uh, output on the Boundmaster 1000E+, plus, for instance. Uh, their representation has something in common called the flying dot display or the impedance plane. So uh, it is 
fairly uh, 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 similar technology. And history, uh, historically, we have seen the Boundmaster 1000 E plus uh, being very, uh, derived from the Nortec instruments. So that's history repeats itself here with a different line of products. The required equipment uh, to do the bound testing C-Scan solution is an Omniscan image with the ECT or ECA module, the edit rent array or the edit rent for channels modules. Uh, a new MHB software uh, that's derived from the MHE software. MHE stands for MH Edit Rent Software. MHB is bound testing. The magic archers here that's that adapter, that small adapter, basically is mm, for various things, but it, it is mainly a voltage adapter to convert the lower voltage editor and signals to a high voltage Boundmaster probe connector here. So the Boundmaster pitch catch plugs into the adapter, which plugs into the Omniscan. And finally, to generate the C-scan, there are three uh, possible uh, scanners that can be employed. So it leaves the user with three options. And the raster scanning here is, if I replay this animation, okay. the raster scanning consists in co uh, covering a surface by scanning left to right and up and basically filling in the surface to generate a C-scan display. So it ensures a 100% coverage. It eliminates quite a bit of the operator dependency uh, as the C-scan has to be filled, and if it's not filled, it's visible on the C-scan. So because of that, it enhances the probability of detecting a defect, and it also increases chances to pick up some smaller defects by thorough analysis of the C-scan view. The option one to perform the scanning is the Olympus Glider Scanner, uh, ideal for flat or not so curved surfaces. It is uh, employing some suction cups, and uh, here it's represented with a phased array ultrasonic probe, but we can replace that hardware easily by either this or the other assemblies comprised of a new uh, probe holder or yoke and an existing Boundmaster SPCP14 or the SPO5629 PHV models. That's the generate one of the latest uh, very performing probe, uh, very good probes. And the SPO5629 has a slightly narrower, narrower tip uh, spacing that allows slightly uh, better sensitivity on smaller flaws. Option two is using the two same probes, but replacing the scanner for a wing scanner that has a whole lot of suction cups available in a couple lengths and ideal for, obviously, a wing of an aircraft, a curved surface. The last option, but not the least, is this new hand scanner uh, uh, that basically has the, the SPCP14 probe only on the wheels. So that's the probe, that's wheels. It is as small as can be. We attached an encoder to it, the, 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 mini, and the mini wheel encoder, and here, is basically a switch to uh, change the index, so it's a clicker switch. So all those uh, hardware pieces work with the new MHB software that is based on MHE. It is very easy to use. It is a stripped down version. So we eliminated all possible menus and options that were not truly useful for somebody doing bomb testing. Uh, so it, it really came from the editor world, and we changed menu names uh, and renaming them so they would make sense for bound testing. It offers a live C-scan view. It has eight frequency capability. Amplitude and phase display are the main features. Obviously allows analysis and easy archiving. The eight frequencies basically uh, will overrun the membrane resonance issue uh, as uh, was described earlier. So that issue was the fact that flaws will not be detected the same way at different frequencies. So when you have more frequencies, you increase the chances of detecting flaws or that, the same flaw. So it basically increases the probability of detection. 
So we came up with that marketing image. Uh, basically, eight bond masters and one made the Omnistan uh, for RF uh, style inspection. Amplitude in phase uh, of the impedance plane. So the flying dot uh, will reveal the nature of the defect. So assuming here this is a good bound condition, if the signal moves away, it typically produces a whole lot of weird signals, but if it moves away from the dot, it chances are this is a disbound. If it changes like this around in circles, it must be a delamination. And if the dot moves closer to the center, it is likely to be a repair or a putty uh, on the uh, sample. And that amplitude and phase display will get uh, actually from the uh, the impedance plane or flying dot display, they will get uh, selected in the, on the software whether you want to have a uh, phase or an amplitude display, and that is useful to generate the CSTN view. This particular CSTN view is a phase display right now. To show the different capabilities, here's a first sample. That is a standard, a reference standard, CHRS type standard. It has six plies, two different cores, and of a bunch of one inch uh, or 25 millimeter uh, defects. So it has obviously uh, this bound, the, lamina uh, the opposite way. So this bound, the lamination, and two puttings on two different cores. So here's a quick animation to show all of the frequencies have been uh, displayed one after the other from 10 kilohertz to 28 kilo kilohertz. So I'm going to replay that animation. To uh, and basically the goal is here is to show that different flaws will reveal themselves at different frequencies and some other flaws will hide rather uh, than, than some others. So let's do some analysis on those uh, CSTN displays. When looking at the far side and the near side at the three same similar frequencies, uh, the repairs will actually get detected on all the frequencies. And that's one of the particularities about the potted areas or repairs is that they typically do something on, on all the frequencies. That's very uh, typical. The disbounds will normally show up better on that uh, on the lower frequencies. Uh, basically, but here we can see that not all flaws are showing up with the same size. That is clearly a one-inch flaw, and it looks about half the size here or here. So uh, that puts in evidence the difference in the response from different frequencies. That was amplitude. So. When we look at amplitude versus phase, we start to have uh, some more uh, capabilities. The repairs will again show through uh, to mostly all frequencies. And the disbounds are likely to show better at lower frequencies, uh, whether they are in amplitude or phase. And the delamination actually do not show at all with the amplitude display, but they start to reveal themselves with the phase display at the higher frequencies. And that's one characteristic that can be exploited with this technology. So the response is frequency dependent. The use of the eight frequencies will reveal disbounds on both the near and the far sides. The disbounds will show better in amplitude on lower frequencies, typically. The DLAMs will be detected by uh, by uh, phase changes mace, uh, modes, uh, mostly, excuse me, and uh, this at higher frequencies. The repairs will be showing up on all frequencies. They will provoke attenuation and also a phase change. Another sample, courtesy, the results are courtesy of Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, it, this is a 12 plies with four different NOMIT scores having artificial flaws, this bounds or delamination, one inch and half inch, and they are inspected from the near side. This is a rather large standard. So the, this, the following example is to illustrate the, the dependency with the defect size. 
So uh, here I want to point out that 14.5 kilohertz and 15 kilohertz, they're pretty close frequency. Uh, however, they're separated by 500 hertz, and that's enough to show a clear difference in on one of the cores. So here's a one inch flaw and a half inch flaw, not revealed at the same frequencies, but looking almost the same uh, size from a certain distance. And here, a one inch, one inch, they really don't look, it's the same flaw and they do not look the same size. And the half inch looks the same at this 30 kilohertz frequency. So it's possible to detect about half inch defects and that's existing in some aircraft procedures today as far as detecting half inch flaws on composite uh, material. As far as the size, to estimate the size, the flaw size, it is possible to use the OmniScan cursor system to basically draw a box around the flaw and estimate its uh, its size from the dimensions displayed on top or in a special, a special menu that's not shown here. So the inspection process of that solution requires a calibration on the standard and selecting the proper frequencies. It requires to normalize, which is an optional but very uh, time-saving uh, function of the new solution. Then uh, there's an actual inspection, analysis and review of indications, and reporting of the saved scans. Now is the time to demonstrate that new uh, solution. So I'm going to switch the display to the uh, OmniScan display. Okay, and what we see now is uh, the instrument being uh, frozen. So imagine uh, the hardware that I have right now is the OmniScan. Obviously, I have this the hand scanner with the SPCP14 probe, and I am scanning a standard uh, reference standard CHRS-1-6. It's a six ply reference standard. It has this bounds, the lamination, and putty. The uh, the reason why I chose that is to show the different type of defects and show how the calibration is performed. So step one is do the calibration of the system. So I'm going to unfreeze my instrument. And actually the fastest way to configure the encoder is to load the uh, hand scanner basic setup. And that's going to save me a whole lot of steps uh, configuring encoder one, encoder two. So it's all preset for me. So I don't have to configure my encoders. It's already working. Okay, so I have that signal. And the only thing I might have to do is configuring the length of my standard uh, of the patch that I want to inspect. So we do in scan area. And uh, obviously I have had entered that earlier. So the distance is already preset, so basically I'm going to scan the entire length and I may adjust this distance here to make sure that I'm filling the screen. Um, what's important not to do is go over the screen and lose some precious uh, data. So I'm ready to go. The next step, step number two, activate what's called the wizard. So there's a shortcut on the front panel of the OmniScan that brings me to the wizard. So I'm going to configure those frequencies. So let's start with eight frequency, frequencies. So set frequencies, uh, I'm going to use something like the default 10, 12, 14, and 16 kilohertz. Uh, going up to 18, 20, uh, let's use maybe 25, 28, and 35, just for the sake of trying on this demonstration. It's a pr fairly well, not so thick, but it's not the thinnest standard I've scanned, so it's probably better at higher frequencies. Okay, now we need to do the um, uh, uh, the balance of the probe. We are going to uh, hit the null key that brings me to a balance menu. So I, I'm lifting the scanner right now in the air and it's performing the air balance. So that's the reference of the middle of the um, uh, impedance plane or um,
flying dot display. Now, I put the probe back on a good area of the standard and I hit normalize part. So I am actually normalizing as I move, the instrument is acquiring point. And what it is doing, what the normalization is doing, is it is doing for me eight times the, uh, it is doing eight times more work than I'm actually doing because it's configuring eight, each of the eight frequencies for me. And it is actually uh, setting up the operating point on the good part to be 180 degrees and 0.2 volts on the flying dot display. That means that I just skipped one major step that I would otherwise would have had to do, which would be to set up the gain and angle for each of the eight frequencies. So I just saved maybe five minutes worth of work trying to calibrate. Okay, the next step will be to, to scan the reference standard. Let's call that step number three and obtain some valid data and perform the fine tuning. And then I'm gonna be ready to inspect. So I position the scanner on the bottom corner of my standard. I hit the reset encoder key on the instrument and I'm ready to go. So right now I'm moving my standard slowly from left to right. I click that index switch. I increment by about a quarter inch up and I re-click the index switch again. So I'm moving sideways from left to right, click and move my scanner uh, right to left, click and move my scanner and so on. So I'm going to cover the entire sample uh, just to have complete data. And while I'm scanning, it's, it's important to keep an eye on the scanner to make sure that I'm not driving that scanner sideways or producing weird scanning patterns because it's a hand scanner. And for more rigidity, it is obviously recommended to use something like the glider scanner or the wing scanner, which will provide a much uh, more uh, control over the scanning pattern uh, to reduce further the operator uh, dependency. So I'm about halfway scanning through my standard here. Uh, might be shifting a bit on the left side, but anyway, I'll keep going. So what I have on the, um, we're gonna do analysis in a minute. So on the le very left, you're gonna see a vertical bar appearing in the C scan, which I'm going to point out later on, but it's, the, it's a core splice. And then there's gonna be a, sit, a set of six different flaws or, uh, indications on the C standard view. And I'm about done, I'm maybe two to three scans uh, away from finishing up this uh, scan. So then I freeze and we are about to start the fine tuning part of the display before getting ready to inspect. So uh, this uh, C scan now that I freeze uh, is showing some interpolation. Now I'm going to move to the display menu, C scan display, and I'm going to basically fine tune the display for each of the frequencies. So right now we're displaying 10 kilohertz, frequency one is 10 kilohertz. Uh, and we are selecting the amplitude component. So we are displaying signals, uh, basically uh, white is zero volts, uh, bluish is about uh, good material and as it gets red, it's likely to be a defect. So what I'm after here, the ideal contrast, uh, I want to have good detection, but not too much background noise. So I'm going to increase the amplitude value. So I actually decrease the contrast. So I might try different values until I'm happy with the result. And to me, that seems pretty good. Uh, I have a very clear, uh, quiet background and I have outstanding detection of the two disk bounds on the right side. So I'm good with the frequency one, we're done. And let's remember that the uh, disk bounds will show better at lower frequencies. Uh, so I'm likely to use the amplitude component for the first frequencies of the set. Now frequency two, and it's displayed at the top of the, um, uh, the, the C scan view, it shows 12 kilohertz. I'm still going to use the amplitude and change the contrast. And here the key is in doubt, you can always try the phase 
uh, correct procedure would be to try the phase, try the amplitude, and use the one that works best. That's what we want to have is contrast. It's that easy to set up. So I'm trying to find the proper contrast that shows the defects uh, a little bit better. And that is almost a personal preference. So next frequency, again, same operation. It's still a pretty good frequency. This is 14 kilohertz. Next frequency, 16. So I, I keep going. I keep adjusting my contrast. Once in a while, I try to phase whether it's good or not. No, still not that great. I preferred the amplitude for it was a much quieter display. We can see on the left the two uh, repairs, and we don't have anything in the middle yet because we're not high enough in frequency uh, for the deluminations. So 18 uh, kilohertz. Let's increase the amplitude and check for the phase. Starting from frequency 5, I'm, st I'm starting to be preferring the uh, phase component, and we can get to see a, uh, an early detection of the delamination on middle top. Uh, that's not that great, so I'm going to revert back to the amplitude, for it was a quieter display. I'll just keep going on the frequencies. So that defaults to uh, phase display. It's already much better. This is actually 25 kilohertz. And it starts to show the delamination, whereas in amplitude we can only get to see the repairs. And that can be a good way to distinguish between a repair from a genuine defect. So that particular frequency, 25 kilohertz here, is a very useful frequency for it sees most of the flaws and it allows to identify the, uh, re uh, the repair areas. So what I could do is I, I could actually save that 25 kilohertz frequency Sorry, I just went back to 25K. I can leave it as amplitude. So we're going to use the 25K to distinguish repairs while we're going to keep going with the higher frequency to show the defects. So that one shows the delimination, middle top and lower, top, uh, lower middle uh, as a phase. So the higher frequencies are likely to show much better results with the phase component. So I'll just keep going to 35 kilohertz. And that is probably the best looking C scan we've had, uh, really showing the delamination. So before we uh, call that good for calibration, let's review all of the frequencies. So let's go back to frequency one. And I'm going to scroll through the frequencies using a shortcut on the front panel that you cannot see from this webinar, but it's basically toggling the frequency. So here's 10 kilohertz, here's 12 kilohertz, here's 14K, showing some one of the disbounds, uh, 16K, um, 18, that must be 25, showing only the repairs. And then we're going to show everything, the DLAMs at 28 and the disbound. And here uh, the delamination show much clearer than the, the actual disbound at 35 kilohertz using the phase display. Good news is the, we can get to see most most of the defects here because we see the repairs in a much different color, pink. We see the disc bound as a clear a blue contrast and we see the two uh, differences in cores, the blue, uh, the blue background from the pink background. So again, let's go back to 10K. We see only the disc bound on the right. We do have uh, 12 kilohertz. We still see the disc bound and we have the two core colors. Then we have a bunch of frequencies showing only one of the disbounds, 14, 16, I believe 18 was not that great. 20, uh, 25 shows the repairs, and then we have two good frequencies for DLAMs. And honestly, I think 35 would be my favorite here to go, uh, uh, to be the default display. So we're done with calibration. Now we're ready to inspect just like the same way we did for calibrating on the standard. So we would unfreeze the instrument and start scanning something. At any time during the, uh, uh, the scanning, it's possible to save just like I'm doing now. I just hit a save key on the front panel and it basically dumps a data file uh, of the whole C scan view so that can be analyzed later. So let's say we're done with inspection here. We found a couple indications and we're reviewing the, uh, and, uh, the defects 
uh, could be in an, in an office or right there at the uh, inspection site. So we can connect a USB mouse to the, uh, the OmniScan. I did not do that, so I'm going to use the, uh, the onboard cursor system, uh, which is just a bit slower than a mouse, but it's still working very good. So I'm actually going to select one of those indications, uh, the delimination from the middle top. Uh, so I'm basically using my cursor system to try to size that defect um, and provide a, an estimate on the dimensions. So the scan length, let's start at 30. I'll just uh, scroll that bar until I get, oops, very close to the edges of the flaw. I really should have had uh, the mouse connected. That's much quicker. Okay, a couple more clicks and I'm done here. So it's also possible to type in the numbers. And here, let's start with 25 and see what happens. Yeah, it's about it's about it. So I just did a box around that flood that, that I was suspecting, and it says 24 millimeter in length by 28. Obviously, it's dependent on the resolution of the pixels, but it gives it still gives a pretty good idea of the size of a flaw. And the actual size on the standard was 25 inches. It is a one inch defect. So it's still not bad for evaluating the size of a flaw. Then the last, the very last step would be to produce a report as needed. So I would go to File menu, Report, and hit the Build function. And the Build function will basically get a, uh, a sum of all the parameters of the bound testing. Uh, there's a whole lot for each frequencies. Uh, and then a clean screenshot at the end, and all of the two-way signatures uh, necessary at the bottom of the report. So I can print that report if I do have a printer connected, or I can save it. For now, I'm just going to close that report. Uh, this quite concludes the live demonstration of the software. I hope you enjoyed it. We are going to revert back to the PowerPoint presentation for I have five or six more slides before we end this webinar. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay, to finish this presentation, here's an actual uh, sample study that we did not so long ago. It's a helicopter blade example. And what is interesting here is that a helicopter blade is nothing but flat. So uh, there's a lot of varying thicknesses, profiles there. So uh, a, a typical fixed frequency inspection would, be, would work, but it's still limited to some areas. And it's possible that uh, different adjustments uh, have to be made on various areas just to perform good uh, have good detection. So by employing the bound testing C-scan, looking at different uh, views, well, this is 7 kilohertz in amplitude. And uh, if we look at 8 kilohertz in phase, we can get, uh, we can still have a very good detection. And uh, one part that is interesting here is the fact that we get a different shade of color from bottom to top. And that's, a, that's an effect from the part uh, profile or thickness that is going to be a bit different on the various parts, uh, the, the, excuse me, the various frequencies. So that at 10 kilohertz in amplitude, we get a very narrow band of most efficient area here at 10K, whereas at 11K, it gets a little bit wider in phase. And on some frequencies, it gets even wider. So that's quite an interesting uh, solution to inspect tapered parts. 14 kilohertz in amplitude is very good. It has a very clear resolution of the two flaws. And in phase, it's still not a bad display at all. So the, the bond testing was, so a C-scan was pretty useful to identify defects on that uh, sample without much more adjustment than I just did. So to conclude this presentation, the benefits of the bound testing C-scan solution is it works on various honeycomb arrangement and profiles. It provides C-scan color, uh, color imagery. 
It is a portable solution, very user friendly. Uh, it provides encoded scans, easy archiving of data. You just have to press a save key. It is certainly an improved detection of various defect types from the eight frequency uh, scanning, detecting defects on near and far side, uh, far side disbounds. It provides easier data interpretation from the image, the image, and definitely improved defect location and sizing. Once again, thank you for attending this webinar. If you want to check out the www.olympus-ims.com, uh, there's a, a flood detector section and uh, OmniScan emits ECA where you can uh, get to the bound testing C-scan um, portion of the instrument and watch for the multimedia tab under this uh, page because there's a very interesting demonstration video and we will keep posting more uh, videos in the future as well. Uh, plus this webinar will also be archived in uh, the uh, knowledge uh, section of the website. So once again, thank you very much for attending this webinar and have a good day. On behalf of Olympus, I'd like to thank Tommy Bourgeois for his participation in today's event. Tommy did a great job. Thanks very much to all the attendees for joining us. We hope this material was informative and useful. This webinar will be archived on the website at www.olympus-ims.com. That's going to do it for this session. Um, all registrants for, for this session will receive follow-up emails with a link to the archived presentation so that you may view this again uh, later on. And thanks again to everyone for participating. We will see you again next time.